um, our oh, our defund SFPD now. Um, they were planning to have an abolitionist community building event on Sunday, the 24th in Dolores Park, but has been rescheduled to November 14th because of the rain. Um, there will be a take what you need station, free food, art making, and community organizations providing resource tables and safety trainings. Our class will have a table at the event, so feel free to post in the community uh, gatherings channel on Discord if you'd like to help um, with the table on November 14th. And like I said, today's discussion is organizing skills, um, which to me personally is uh, a super important topic and something that I directly am passionate about. Um, and yeah, so today we'll be discussing organizing skills and first we'll be joined by Louis Michael Jr. And please tell me if I say that right. <laughs> and Francis Yu of Vessels of Vallejo who will discuss their abolition NIST organizing in Vallejo. Then our comrades at Defund SFPD Now will discuss their public safety in the mission project. And finally, we will hear from Kristen Marshall from the DOPE project who will discuss harm reduction. And, you know, I first just want to introduce myself. Um, I go by Jazz, she, her pronouns. Um, I am a abolitionist uh, grassroots community organizer. Um, my background, actually, um, my background is, so this picture was taken at an ARCO station. Um, a lot of you know that, uh, so this is a picture of my close friend, Derek Gaines, about the way um, there was ex, uh, well, trigger warning, first off, um, includes police terrorism and um, death of a black relative. Um, so he was killed. Um, at the ARCO in, S in South San Francisco by Joshua Cabillo, who is currently at SFPD uh, at the mission department. Um, and this is a picture of him with a sign that says Black Lives Matter that we put up at his anniversary this year with roses. I chose this picture because I feel that he's a big reason why I do this and why I started this, this journey. Um, and myself, I am a lighter brown cis woman. Um, as I've been learning more, like my whole life I've identified as Latina, but I now uh, identify as of indigenous descent. Um, my hair is like straight today, curled up. I'm wearing a black hoodie with the black tank top with a tattoo on my right side that says beautiful struggle. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to my co-facilitator. Where you at? <laughs> to introduce Hi. herself. Hi, my name is Yana Rodriguez. Um, my, my pronouns are she, her. And a visual description would be uh, um, I have uh, wavy brown hair. Right now, and I have on a light blue shirt and a black sweater with uh, blue flowers on it. Um, so I'm going to, so we are. I'm back. My apologies. I am right now. Um, so I'm going to have my camera off, but I'm still going to be speaking. So I was at the land acknowledgement. Um, so we are on Ohlone land. And are uh, speaking to us. Payments towards Black, Indigenous, and people of color speakers prioritized. Please contribute to the fund if you are a less systemic impacted person who is benefiting from this space. The Zoom moderators will post the link in the chat. We are also including our comrade Lewis Michaels GoFundMe to support his mother's 
fight against cancer. We are holding space for the family. Donations can also be sent directly to Hey, Sianna, sorry, your audio is really off. Um, do you want to try joining through your phone? Fine, via Cash App. Sure. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. Jazz, would you maybe be down to read uh, Sianna's lines? Um, yes, I can read thank it. Thank you so much. No worries. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you want to go back to it, to the other slide real quick, please. Um, so yeah, I think this slide's very important. Um, so we want to acknowledge, oh, okay, well, we have a mutual aid fund that will go towards paying our speakers uh, for presenting to us with payments towards Black, Indigenous, and people of color, speakers prioritized. Um, so please contribute to the fund if you are a less systems impacted person who is benefiting from this space. The Zoom moderators will post a link in the chat as they did. And as um, Lena said that, you know, we are also including our comrade Luis Michaels GoFundMe who is speaking today um, to support his mother's fight against cancer. And we are holding space for the family and Sunshine Spencer's recovery. Donations can also be sent directly to Sunshine via Cash App, uh, money sign physical therapy is key and Venmo sunshine dates, the Z. And our care coordinators, uh, Tierra and Kari will be providing collective care during the session with black indigenous people of color prioritized. Please DM them if you are feeling triggered or re-traumatized by the content being discussed. If you need to be provided with care resources or need a, into a breakout room with someone to take a break from the session, our Zoom moderators, uh, we'll share the anonymous care form in the chat where you can provide feedback on the session as well. Collective care is central to abolition as we have learned in our previous sessions. So thank you, Kari and uh, Tiara, as always. Uh, Diana, are you back or did you want me to read your, your slide as well? Uh, sorry, I'm still trying to join the meeting through my other device. Yeah, no worries. Um, is it okay if I read yours? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So, uh, so we want to introduce Vessels of Alejo. Um, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, Vessels of Alejo came together to organize. Our community needed a place to direct their pain, hurt, anger, and outrage that came from the effects of white supremacy and systemic racism that has forever plagued our nation. Vessels is a team of Vallejo natives and residents who are passionate about creating true change. Because of our opposition to capitalism, we have a non-hierarchical organizational structure. We are black indigenous people of color led and have many allies who are part of our team. Vessels of Vallejo holds the mission of building community power through mutual aid, political education, and the dismantling of oppressive systems. So today we are joined by Vessels of Alejo organizers and steering community members alongside Luis Michael and Francis Yu. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, and thank you for creating like such a beautiful space to kind of continue to learn and grow and kind of build community through abolition. I think it's just such beautiful and important work. I'm gonna go ahead and to share my screen uh, um, and then we can start with our intros. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what happened to, um, great, cool. So uh, like Jazz said, my name is Francis. I use they, them pronouns. I'm an organizer and steering committee member of an organization called Vessels of Vallejo. Um, on this title slide, um, there is an image um, of some young folks holding a Black Lives Matter sign uh, behind a barricade and opposite to them is a policeman in riot gear and uh, kind of standing in front of a police vehicle. Uh, we're gonna 
talk a little bit really largely about the organizing dynamics and how that's kind of changed and shifted over the past year. Um, and, and so we'll go ahead and, and just talk a little bit or introduce ourselves a little bit further. Um, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, so my name is Francis. Again, I use the pronouns um, and just a little bit of a description, a visual description of myself right now. Um, I am in a room in the wall. You can see it's like a beige wall. I'm wearing a white t-shirt. I am sort of um, tan skin, Asian and male presenting. Um, I'm wearing wireframe glasses and my hair is yellow and red. Um, and um, a little bit more about me, I am from Vallejo um, and I come to the space kind of with experience in community organizing and community development, as well as local government and really largely through the lens of urban planning. And though I, I challenge that and I add the caveat of really trying to understand more from like a radical and insurgent urban planning tradition. Um, over the past kind of year and a half, uh, definitely since kind of like the onset of the pandemic, I've uh, split my time kind of fairly between uh, Vallejo um, and New York City um, or uh, still in Lenape land, and more specifically in Bushwick within, uh, the, um, within Brooklyn. Um, and in Vallejo, I had founded Defund Vallejo PD, which later then merged to uh, with Vessels of Vallejo. Um, and that's kind of like the entity that I organized through. Um, and then here in New York, I presently focus my work um, on mutual aid work um, around Bushwick, um, but also food sovereignty and farming work in upstate New York in um, stolen Mohawk land. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to my friend and comrade Lewis. Thank you, Francis. And thank you to the facilitators um, for allowing us this, this opportunity in this space and, and setting this up so nicely. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for the, the plug for my, my mom's GoFundMe. That's truly appreciated. And um, I appreciate all of the energy that has been sent my way through that. Um, my name is Louis Michael. I use he, him pronouns. I am a male presenting black um, male and I have a beard, black beard, mustache, and black hair that is styled in a short fro. Um, in my background, I have a few pictures. I'm sitting in my living room um, and I have a few pictures in my background of family portraits and things. Um, and I'm wearing a burgundy shirt. Uh, I'm an organizer and steering committee member of Vessels of Vallejo. Um, I've lived all over the Bay Area. Um, and I do want to say uh, Francis and myself are both products of the community college uh, system. So just being a part of this space is amazing. And I'm so like, I think we're both excited to know that like this, this space is really being held um, on a college campus, a community college campus. Um, so I went to Contra Costa College um, and I played football and City College always beat us. So, um, that's just a little background there. Uh, I recently got involved in community organizing after graduated, after graduating um, from a four year that I went to in Kansas. Uh, I graduated last year and came home uh, to a national uprising resulting from the murder of George Floyd. Um, I also ran for city council uh, last year. And um, I'm currently teaching middle school computer science in Vallejo and I'm pursuing a master's degree um, an education from Toro University. Uh, I'm married, I have a six month old baby boy and I focus most of my time on community organizing with vessels, uh, school teaching and my family. All right, so, um, just to get started with a little bit of the history um, behind Vessels of Vallejo. Um, so like I mentioned in my intro about um, coming home after graduating college, um, it, was, it was in May of 2020, right around the time George Floyd had uh, been killed by police. Um, 
I want to say, give a trigger warning. Um, we're not gonna talk a lot about police violence, but um, for a lot of the organizing we have done in these first three points, it has been around police violence. So Sean Monterosa, um, defunding Vallejo PD and people's budget. So if, if those things come up, um, uh, I just wanted to give a warning. Um, so I started to organize um, when I got home, I went to a few protests. I was organizing in Richmond a little bit. And then I, I learned that there was a lot going on in Vallejo specifically, and I wanted to get involved and I wanted to, to do something. Um, I didn't know a lot about the, the organizing dynamics here in Vallejo. I hadn't seen or heard of any other organizations until I got into organizing more and, and started to learn that. Um, but I called up a bunch of people that I knew from around Vallejo and from high school and things like that. And we formed Vessels of Vallejo. Um, our first protest was on June 13th where we protested Sean Monterosa's murder. Um, and shortly after that, we just continued to organize and continued to expand the work that we were doing in Vallejo and continued to have protests and, and actions. And then we later expanded into mutual aid work. Um, and yeah, so I'll pass it over to Francis to talk more about um, Defund VPD. Cool, thanks. Um, so yeah, I think around the same time that Lewis was starting Vessels, um, I was also kind of back home in Vallejo and, and this was kind of the, the time when we were seeing large calls to defund police departments kind of starting to happen um, across the nation. Um, I had some background in this and that like uh, for like my my thesis in grad school I, I did kind of cover largely about like um, Vallejo's budget process and, and more specifically the participatory budgeting system that they have. Um, so I felt like there was just like a little bit of, um, or there was like a confluence, I think, of, of skills and interest in terms of how I could kind of like meet that need. Um, and so I, I'll talk a lot more about the people's budget. That's gonna be one of the organizing campaigns that we'll kind of dive into. So I'll save, you know, the greater detail uh, for when we talk about that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so essentially the work from Defund eventually merged to uh, work we started doing through Vessels of Vallejo. Uh, we formally merged our groups together um, in the fall of last year um, and have since then kind of taken on a ton of different kind of like campaigns within the city of Vallejo. Um, and, and so a couple of those here that we've listed out, um, we had Randy Reasoner, who was uh, the interim city attorney who was applying to become kind of like the permanent city attorney position. And we um, organized a ton of opposition, um, which looked kind of like, you know, Collins to the different meetings, uh, tweets, posters, um, and some demonstrations to try to oppose that appointment. And essentially, uh, Randy Reasoner is sort of like implicated in the constellation, I think, of, you know, both um, inept and also corrupt city officials that were kind of like running Vallejo kind of like behind the scenes and really kind of skirting any um, and all forms of accountability that communities, um, particularly impacted communities, were trying to get from the city, right? Um, another campaign that we um, were helping to lead was uh, the Fire Nyhoff campaign, and really largely, you know, uh, Greg Nyhoff, who was our city manager, his sort of like tied to um, the badge bending scandal. That's a major sort of like, you know, uh, police violence. Um, sort of trigger, I'm actually not even gonna talk about that all too much here, but if folks are unaware of the badge bending scandal by the Bolivia Police Department, that's something that folks can feel free to, you know, Google and look up on their own. This was something that was covered, you know, first and foremost by independent local journalists, um, but then was like such a heinous and evil act that got, you know, picked up um, through other national outlets. So. It's definitely not coverage, but because of Greg Nyhoff's implications to that, we organized a ton of um, just surmounting sort of like uh, pressure that just called attention to uh, both, you know, this particular act um, and, and his role in sort of covering up the badge bending scandal, but then also lots of his, you know, inept ties to um, 
just protecting and preserving the the um, the presence and and the sort of institution of, of police in Valaya. Um, another thing we had organized around was um, a growing number of Brown Act violations. So the Brown Act essentially are laws that stipulate um, and kind of like help preserve and protect the people's and, and the general public sort of right to know about various um, public processes that are happening at like various stages of, of government, both local and state. Um, and, and some of these things include like, you know, providing enough notice before there's gonna be a public meeting, uh, providing a sufficient um, amount and way of uh, doing and providing public comment. And as we were like, you know, really turning up the pressure and, and increasing uh, the, the community's presence in various meetings, um, basically city hall, would try to figure out ways to kind of like, you know, limit these comments, whether it was, you know, comments could last no longer than 30 seconds, or they would stop actually taking comments in via phone call, they would silently read them. And we were just supposed to like expect that they were silently reading hundreds of comments. Like it was just a mess, um, but we basically increased a ton of pressure. Uh, we, uh, brought sort of a legal challenge and eventually got to got them to make sure that they were still ensuring uh, that there were proper channels of uh, public comments at, at the meetings that they were having. Um, Louis, you want to cover the, the rest of them? Sure. Um, so another local campaign that we um, were a part of was No VPD Waterfront Station. Um, we organized a little bit around um, Vallejo Police Department was trying to spend uh, about four million dollars on a new waterfront station so the station would be on the Vallejo waterfront um, and they would have been upgrading from their their current police station and there was a lot of community um, involvement around this some people supported it some people didn't um and uh vessels we organized a protest where uh we wanted to kind of raise the attention around this issue and we showed up at the waterfront station um that we found out was um being used although the Vallejo police department hadn't completely like sealed the deal on per, on the purchase and haven't been ha, hadn't been approved to start using the the facility um so there was a ribbon cutting um event that was supposed to be held and we showed up to the ribbon, ribbon cutting to protest and they they claimed to postpone the or the the ribbon cutting and we later found out that the ribbon cutting took place indoors um even though they put out a public announcement that they would be postponing. Um, is there anything I'm missing around the waterfront station, Francis? Okay. And then for our billboards for justice, um, this is something we did along with the Monterosa family, um, Sean Monterosa um, sisters, Ashley and Michelle have, we have, um, collaborated with them a lot in the past on different actions and events and and campaigns and this one was uh, a campaign where we had a bunch of billboards go up around Vallejo um, at different times and the billboards read justice for Sean Monterosa and had a picture of Sean Monterosa in black and white and we we had a contract with the billboard company and um, and hoped to have more, more um, victims of police violence um, put up on those billboards and that ended up not happening. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, that was another campaign that we did. Um, and then mutual aid, um, Francis, if you wanna start off on what we do for mutual aid. And yeah, um, so mutual aid I think has been like a really big Thing that we've started to shift our focus on, I think, over the past um, year, uh, or at least since the beginning of like 2021. Um, in my mind, it's still 2020 because like that, you know, cursed year will not leave my imagination. But um, 
but basically like you know we just saw that like there was just a really like big lack of resources in terms of resources um, primarily in, and particularly for unhoused communities and our unhoused neighbors in in Vallejo right and, and you know it's tough we have like navigated certain roles kind of in that space but it's, it's just tricky right we don't get um, Vallejo is a really poor city in a poor county in a really rich region, right? Um, so it, it's tough for us to access certain services and programs and a lot of that has meant that we've kind of just had to show up for folks like, um, you know, on the times kind of like on the fly, um, we, we've navigated several sort of like evictions threats over just the past couple of weeks where we need to kind of show up and provide assistance as these kinds of emergencies um, arise. But for our mutual aid work, essentially, we provide, um, we do weekly distributions um, to a handful of different encampments in the city. Um, and, you know, usually we're giving out like uh, toiletries, wipes, um, batteries, butane canisters for, um, for portable stoves, et cetera, things that are kind of like general quality of life. I think there are other, you know, organizations, and I don't know that I would necessarily call them mutual aid organizations that do like, you know, food and hot food and produce. But for us, you know, we don't want to kind of like overlap there. We're providing some other things that I think folks have um, have communicated with us and have told us are like big, you know, priorities for them. So that's kind of like our big, um, that's been kind of like a really big switch for us. And we, you know, fundraise and, and spend about 300 to $400 a week doing these distributions. Um, and a lot of that kind of just like, I mean, most of that is really just like um, fundraising from within our communities that, that can kind of provide um, funds for us to continue that work. So that's, that's what that's been looking like. And, and you know, I'm not going to lie, like this, this space, and I think all the spaces that we navigate are fairly new, right? Um, and so um, there's kind of a larger question of like how we really build in the political education and movement building to the mutual aid work that we're doing. And I think that's something that other mutual aid organizers in our space have you know, also called us in and really kind of interrogating how we're doing that, how we're really kind of you know, building a space where we're producing that good and creating a conditions where we're organizing and real doing real community building and movement building. Um, and, and that's, I think, a very serious and real sort of interrogation that we are you know, currently navigating with, with these other organizers to make sure that we are you know on track and really kind of driven by radical principles of mutual aid so that's just a like full disclosure in terms of where we are at in the mutual aid space in in Balea. so that was like a really big overview but i think that's also you know i i think originally lewis and i kind of wanted to just like do like a flash kind of like run or like a lightning run in terms of what these were but i think that also kind of just exemplifies the ways in which organizing has really sort of it's sort of amorphous, right? Like, and especially when you're like responding to all of these various like concerns that arise from a city and also a city as tumultuous and like fucked up as Vallejo, like it gets wild and you kind of just have to go where the need is and really figure out where, where to build pressure, right? Um, so that's just to kind of like highlight the ways in which, you know, these different trajectories have kind of gone through our past like year of organizing. Um, just to go into like, something a little bit more deeply. And I think we'll, we'll also gonna be trying to be mindful of time. I'm gonna share really quickly um, this report that we released. So this is our like uh, people's budget um, work that we've, um, is that, right? um, that we've done and really focused a ton of our organizing efforts um, both last year and this year. I'm gonna put a link if folks wanna check out the report on their own in the chat. Um, Essentially, the people's budget is like um, it's a participatory action research approach, meaning that, you know, there are, you know, real sort of like qualitative and quantitative research methods here that are embedded into this, this study and this report, but we're making sure that we're trying to integrate and bring in the people who are going to be impacted by this study, right, and that they have like an actual voice and are re reflected and get to kind of participate on, on different like aspects of, of this um, study and approach. Um, and essentially, it's, it's a survey that seeks to gauge the ways in which people would like their resources to be distributed. This, this kind of follows the framework and sort of approach of People's Budget LA, which had come out last year. Um, 
And it required, you know, on the ground efforts and grassroots efforts where we were canvassing, we were at the farmers markets, we were like public spaces, basically just talking to everyone and anyone about the city budget process and really showing them what that looked like. Um, and then showing them what the resource allocation was, right? Like, I think it blew everyone's mind that we were spending 46.5% of the budget that we could spend on just on police alone, right? And, and for folks who know Vallejo, it's like we, it's, it's a struggle for a lot of folks. It's a, a largely like low income, uh, predominantly community of color um, city, um, yet we have like such a lack in like, you know, lots of services um, aimed towards youth or aimed towards um, community development and such. Um, so this was just a way for people to kind of understand what that breakdown was and then also to get them to participate in like, okay, actually this is what I would like the city to spend money on. This is what I think is like, you know, an, a priority and a value for me. So that was kind of like one aspect of this as well. Um, and the other was like to organize, you know, this pressure that we could then use at the city council meetings where they would vote on the budget hearing. So the first year was mad successful. Um, and, you know, we had a ton of um, public comments um, and we actually pushed back the vote or re reached or reject vote um, to, on two separate occasions, right? So those were like pretty cool, like victories. They ultimately at the end actually adopted um, a budget. So they ended up just like postponing, um, postponing their vote and, and adopted, adopted the budget that they'd originally proposed. So ultimately we were not able to kind of get that win, but I think we were also able to like garner, you know, like hundreds and hundreds of um, public input in this process and, and really kind of bring this narrative and bring this conversation up to like people's like minds and to the forefront of like the conversation that was happening locally in Malaya. Um, and there have been like some really kind of interesting differences when we look at what the people's budget looked like in uh, 2020 versus 2021. Um, so in 2020, there were just like all these like kind of like real conditions that made it easier for people to participate, right? Such as being able to work from home or having like a little bit added flexibility. Um, if folks were laid off or unemployed, there were additional sort of unemployment benefits um, that um, allowed a little bit more kind of flexibility in terms of what they could do with their time. Um, on also kind of like the really big focus of the media landscape and coverage of protests, particularly after the, the deaths and police murders of, um, of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. There was just a lot, I think, of, of coverage and pressure to like really kind of like amp it up. Um, this year, we found that it's like, you know, different. And I'm seeing this both in Vallejo and in New York, right? The general sort of like reopening of things and the quote unquote return to normalcy when we very much so in the middle of a pandemic, um, the shirking away of these public benefits, though like there actually haven't been anything that's actually continuing to support us and folks still largely need these benefits. Um, and, and also sort of kind of going back to the narrative of quote unquote normalcy, right? This sort of perception that we have reached justice just because there was kind of like an individual prosecution which we know right as abolitionists that prosecution is one not justice and two that you know just an individual sort of um indictment is is not necessarily an indictment on the entire system that is actually entirely flawed um so um, I think these kinds of differences have like, you know, shifted the ways in which people have been able to turn out or, or kind of their energy behind sort of the momentum and the movement. Um, so kind of directly related to that, the results have like slightly kind of changed. Um, and they've, they've largely changed in terms of the number of surveys that we were able to collect. Last year, we were able to do, I think like 1200 or 1300 um, participants had you know, contributed to the survey this year was, you know, closer to 700. So it dropped off significantly. But in terms of what the results show, um, you know, the results are still largely the same. No one is trying to spend 45, 46% of the city's budget on police, period. Um, there were also some differences in strategy that we were able, right? We, I think we're just able to learn. Like last year when we did the people's budget, it was just like so quick. Everything was thinking on our feet. Everything was pivot from pivot from pivot. This year we had some time to think about like what kind of different strategies we could employ. Um, last year was sort of just like gnarly kind of like all hands 
on deck um, and on the ground sort of efforts. This year, we were trying to think about, you know, there's a different, um, there's a different sort of uh, city council sort of makeup. So we were thinking about, you know, did the, would these kind of result in potentially new relationships or new partnerships that we can kind of move forward with a, a different budget priority. Um, while, you know, there is definitely a different makeup in terms of city council, we were still working with a minority city council. So that, you know, ultimately did not work a, in our sort of um, effort. And so we're continuing to figure out if, you know, well, one, I think we're just largely questioning the, the whole efficacy of electoral um, organizing and what that means for us. Although, you know, I will say that many abolitionists, you know, there's absolute value in trying to tackle abolition from as many sides as possible. Um, and then the second sort of like big difference in strategy. So we had a lot of support from ACLU. We were able to use um, SurveyMonkey. And I think that just adds a level of like perceived legitimacy in terms of when people are taking the survey and when we're presenting results. Um, and then we were also able to use um, their tax banking, um, their tax banking um, software so that we can kind of like reach a wider like breadth of people. So that was like super helpful in getting us like, you know, more people. And I think if we were able to more strategically use that in the next couple of campaigns, that could be an interesting uh, way forward for us. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of like showing like kind of meta, like the differences that we've kind of navigated between uh, 2020 and 21 uh, for, for people's budget and how that affects our organizing. All right, thank you. Um, I did wanna do a time check cause I know that we're, we may be over. Um, is it okay if we take a couple minutes to wrap up? I think that should be fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, the last um, campaign we wanna talk about um, is just the Billboards for Justice. Um, this is something that uh, we did um, in Vallejo, adjacent to the Vallejo Police um, Department's headquarters. And we fundraised, fundraised to have the billboard up for a few months before switching the billboard design to commemorate a call for justice to all other victims. Uh, we were able to do a whole bunch of different things with this campaign, such as picnics, um, uh, demonstrations and events, things that were bringing community together um, and maintaining that awareness and energy around supporting impacted families. Um, unfortunately, uh, the billboard company, um, Clear Channel, uh, declined to run the, the ad that we tried to have ran that commemorated um, all 37 uh, lives that had been lost to Vallejo police since 1997. Um, and their, the claim was that it was too political and they were gonna charge a, a higher fee for us to, to run certain ads. And um, so we ended up ending that contract and we, we're currently just trying to find a better way or not better. I believe that the, the billboard um, was an amazing way to bring light to what was going on in Vallejo, but we want to have a more community um, centered approach to, to raising awareness around this. And so we are currently developing ways to continue to support impacted family through arts activism and um, are looking for ways to, to commemorate those who have lost their lives um, through, through some other form of art in Vallejo. Um, if you do go to our like social media on Facebook and Instagram, we do have a post that details this a little bit more, um, but I'll move on for the sake of time. And I'll let uh, Francis sort of wrap it up. Is that right or? Yeah, I can wrap us up just so that we can get to the other amazing speakers for tonight. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, wanted to really talk today about how as organizers, we're navigating, you know, some new conditions, right? Different um, makeup of city officials and elected officials. Like Vallejo has lost something like half a dozen high level city officials in this year alone, right? And that's just like, there's, I'm just telling you, it's like such a tumultuous place to organize and power structures and dynamics. Our power map looks wildly different from when we first did that exercise to today. Um, so it's like all these have, 
have changed the ways in that we're strategizing and we're continuing to have to think on our feet. Uh, we're also have, having to navigate sort of the differences in engagement and turnout. And I think that's like a really interesting thing for us, right? We're really kind of committed to that work, but how do we continue to build community? How do we continue to build folks like interest and dedication and commitment to this work? We know that the changes that we're going for aren't gonna happen tomorrow and perhaps not even in our lifetime, right? Like a lot of the shit that we're fighting for have, have been in works for, you know, years and generations and, and centuries. Um, so how do we get people to kind of commit to that knowing that this is the way forward, right? Um, but I think we're still navigating some of the very same realities. I think, you know, one thing that was had come clear when we were doing the People's Budget Fight this year was that there was like such a uh, commitment to the status quo by people who are in power, right? They kept talking about how actually 46% of the police is status quo. This is what everyone is doing. And it's like, how can we get people to, cha to challenge that, right? Why is that the status quo? Why are we continuing to look to police to solve an answer for everything when clearly they're not doing that job and clearly they're implicating so much more harm? Um, so continuing to challenge that and continuing to like really grapple with these larger structural um, and systemic problems, like that's very much a reality that hasn't changed, right? Because all we've done is these very serious systems of reforms. We've never actually gotten to a place where we've abolished something and like just said, hey, this isn't working entirely. Let's figure something else out. Um, we're still holding on and we're going to hold on to the notion that abolition is the necessary way forward. Um, again, just talking about reform, that's not going to get us anywhere. We know that the existing modern system of policing today is actually already something that's been reformed over and over and over again with a larger goal of maintaining white supremacy in a capitalist system. Um, so these promises of reform are bullshit ass promises, right? And so that's something that we continue to push back on. Um, and we are trying to find, you know, alternative ways, right? We challenge that by continuing to try to raise awareness. That's why spaces like this are incredibly important. We organize resistance in, in the ways that we can, where we, where we can call things out. And by creating and sustaining, you know, these alternative ways of, of care, of community building, such as mutual aid. So these are, you know, things that we continue to grapple with and are so glad that, you know, we're in a space here with folks who are kind of grappling these same realities and continuing to move forward. Um, you know, and so I think, you know, a question that I'd ask the folks as y'all kind of reflect is like, you know, is there a particular organizing campaign, particularly locally, that has really inspired you to take and sustain action? And then, you know, I, I'm really curious, and I think this is just a good self-reflection thing, like, why? Like, what has kept you interested? What has kept you engaged? Um, so again, thank you, um, Louis, for spending your time. Thank you, uh, CCSF, for creating this space for us. Um, and then these are ways to kind of like get, get engaged and continue to, you know, to keep in contact with us. Thank you so much to um, Vessels uh, of Vallejo. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us. And now um, defund SFPD now will speak for 15 minutes. Thank you so much. Um, hi everyone, hello y'all. My name is Aritra. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, um, and all my access needs are met. Uh, first off, let me just say that I'm really humbled to be here uh, as someone who, uh, as someone who works, uh, donates part of my time and in, uh, in volunteering uh, for these abolitionist causes. I'm really inspired and humbled to be here alongside and learning from uh, so many talented and dedicated organizers. Uh, for a quick visual description, um, I am a brown-skinned Indian person uh, wearing a white t-shirt and uh, I'm male presenting, I'm also wearing round glasses and sitting in front of a pretty uninspiring blank wall with some curtains off to the side. So, a little bit about me, uh, I I'm an immigrant. I my two hometowns are Kolkata, India, and uh, Jackson, Mississippi, uh, which is where my family settled after moving to America. I so I am not a San Francisco native. However, uh, I am currently living in the Mission District uh, of San Francisco. 
I'm here talking about uh, Defund SFPD's Public Safety in the Mission Project. Um, as the name suggests, this uh, focuses specifically on the Mission uh, District neighborhood of San Francisco. In particular, uh, we are uh, the area that we focus on is the police precinct covered by the Mission Police Station at 17th and Valencia. So that is kind of the, the uh, boundary of the area where we're focusing our organizing. And uh, our goal is to build and popularize uh, public safety and community safety as an alternative to policing and introduce these ideas to folks who may not really be uh, comfortable with a uh, sort of idea and especially folks who are kind of uncomfortable with abolitionist and defunding ideas. Um, as many of us know, the Mission District is a gentrified and rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. And to put it lightly, there are a lot of folks moving here who do not know their neighbors, who don't really know the history of the neighborhood and uh, who don't have a lot of community in the area and who are also fairly comfortable uh, calling 911 uh, or other emergency services and uh, calling police uh, when they see a situation because they are unfamiliar with their neighbors and they've enjoyed certain uh, privileges uh, in the past related to uh, calling forces. Uh, and so a lot of our focus is on uh, talking to folks who uh, are in the neighborhood and introducing these ideas that you do not always have to call the police when uh, you see uh, an event or you know, a situation where you feel that you need some support or help. Uh, one of the primary things we focus on is just getting neighbors to get to uh, know each other such that uh, there is a higher barrier to uh, kind of uh, calling in outside forces to intervene so that people are a little bit more familiar with their block, with their neighbors, with their community, and can understand uh, sort of uh, issues that are going on, uh, especially uh, when it comes to unhoused folks uh, and unhoused neighbors who live on our blocks. Uh, we definitely want people to have an idea of who, of who lives there, uh, understand that these are our neighbors, and uh, that way uh, we are trying to basically raise the barrier to calling the police uh, for any of these folks. The primary uh, way in which we engage uh, with the public in uh, this area is through door knocking and passing out flyers. I'm going to briefly share my screen and uh, show one of the flyers uh, that we pass out. The title here uh, is resources to call instead of the police. We have four sections here for housing services, for mental health, for domestic violence and sexual assault, as well as substance use. Uh, many of these uh, numbers are well-known, uh, incredible organizations in the mission that are working to bring public safety to the community who have been doing this for a long time, but often they are not present uh, at certain events because police have been called first. Uh, and so uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to connect neighbors with these kinds of resources. There are two other sections in this flyer that we pass out. There is one, uh, called Why Consider Not Calling the Cops, where we introduce uh, I, where we introduce to folks that are fairly comfortable with calling the cops uh, ideas and uh, sort of uh, things to think about before uh, doing so automatically. Uh, we do encounter, as we door knock and talk to people, a lot of people who are uncomfortable with calling the cops, but at the end of the day, that's what they've grown up doing. That's what they've been taught to do. And they don't know who else to call or what else to do. And so that's, uh, I think, a really good uh, position to start a conversation from. We say, you know, if you were uh, in a situation where someone might want to call the cops on you, what would you rather have done, right? What would you, uh, would you rather have someone have just uh, come and talk to you if it's a really simple issue, like a noise complaint or something like that? Um, and so we start introducing the idea that, you know, folks in the community can help each other out, keep uh, each other safe. Uh, absolutely. I will uh, make sure to uh, get this document shared out. Uh, I unfortunately will not be able to uh, stay uh, late uh, for the Q&A and discussion, but there are several other great uh, folks from Defund SFPD here uh, who will be able to uh, deal with those resources. The other uh, section that we have here, uh, and probably the spiciest section to many of the folks that we talk to, is uh, basically explaining why we are not a reformist organization, why we uh, want to defund SFPD and eventually abolish uh, the prison industrial complex everywhere uh, that it exists. 
And this is an idea that many of the folks that we specifically talk to are uh, not very comfortable with. And uh, one of the things we have been working on while organizing is how do we introduce this idea? Um, some of the things that we've learned is that even though a lot of people are turned off by the word defund, uh, what's even worse is being dodgy about it, right? We, we don't want to kind of uh, come in and say, hey, you know, we are just neighbors talking about, uh, talking about community safety, et cetera. And then all of a sudden we drop defund and they're kind of surprised. Uh, so uh, when someone asks what organization we're with, we are pretty clear we're with the defund SFPD campaign. And we encounter many people who don't agree with that but are still sort of willing to talk because at the end of the day, we showed up to their door and uh, you know, the folks that answer their door are generally willing to have a bit of a conversation with you. And so we've spoken to many folks who do not agree with defunding, but who still take the flyer anyway, because they say, well, I definitely don't want to call the cops all the time. Right? And so uh, we think this is a decent incremental step to at least reduce uh, police interactions with the public to reduce the number of instances in which they're called so that they have less of a basis to continually ask for budget increases. And uh, generally to start introducing folks in the community to the idea that there are other ways uh, to deal with uh, issues in your community and to keep people safe. Ultimately, that is uh, you know, a step towards our goal in building networks of community safety, uh, where folks uh, start to know each other and start to help each other out uh, more directly. We definitely have, uh, uh, we definitely understand that there are, there are limits to door knocking and passing out flyers. There are many folks that uh, we're still able to reach. That being said, as we talk to folks in the community, we also learn a ton from them. Uh, we ask, uh, we usually start by asking questions uh, to the folks we're talking to when we uh, knock on their doors about what they feel would keep them safe in their community. And the interesting thing is that like most people don't start off by answering cops, right? Most people uh, talk about basic things, uh, basic things like pedestrian safety, uh, lighting, uh, and sort of like, res uh, and many folks bring up uh, that, you know, they've seen many unhoused folks in the community and they wish that there were more resources to help. They wish that there were uh, folks that they could call uh, who uh, did not show up in force it the way that, uh, that SFPD does. Uh, so this, these kinds of questions kind of seed a lot of really interesting discussions about what public safety actually means and starts to kind of decouple this idea of safety and uh, from the idea of police and introduce people to the idea that there are, there are other ways to do this. That is pretty much it uh, for my content. Again, thank you uh, uh, so much to the CCSF uh, facilitators and for the other organizers here. Uh, really happy to hear uh, from all of you. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you so much and happy birthday. Um, so we will now begin our 10 minute break, um, which will be followed by Dope Project.
Hello, everyone. I hope you had a good break. We are now, we're back, and we will now hear from Kristen, or Kristen Marshall from the DOPE Project. DOPE Project, or the Drug Overdose Prevention and Education Project, is the largest single city, uh, sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce that word, I'm sorry. Naloxone. Naloxone distribution program in the country. They've trained more than 13,000 people in San Francisco on how to administer naloxone to reverse an overdose and uh, otherwise fatal overdose from opioids. Since its inception in, tw in 2003, the DOPE project has become a world-renowned program featured in CDC reports, innovative research, and its best practice program for integrated community-based naloxone distribution. For, before Kristen begins her presentation, we want to add that there are, con there are content warnings on drug use, overdose, and racism. Hi, everyone. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here. Um, you're catching me at the end of uh, a long day, so I apologize if my energy feels low. Uh, my name is Kristen Marshall, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a white woman with short blue-green hair, um, meticulously applied eyeliner. Um, I'm wearing a white tank top and have um, Dahlia's tattooed on my shoulder. Um, and I am sitting in a glass office in the bowels of a WeWork um, because that's the only office my little nonprofit can afford to rent in San Francisco. Uh, um, and um, like it was mentioned, I currently, um, so I used to manage the DOPE project and now I am, um, this is like nonprofit, uh, the most nonprofit title on the planet, but uh, I am the associate director of San Francisco programs at the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, so I now oversee all of our San Francisco harm reduction and our community-based harm reduction and overdose prevention and naloxone or Narcan distribution efforts in San Francisco. Um, and so just like a little bit about me, um, I, this is uh, my 11th year living in San Francisco. Um, I'm originally from North Carolina, a small town called Cary, North Carolina. Um, I am the daughter of people who use drugs. Um, I've been loved by people who use drugs my entire life. Uh, I'm the daughter of drug users, formerly incarcerated um, parents um, who I just adore um, and who adore me. And so I'm from, um, I've been raised and, and have existed my entire life alongside people who use drugs. I am a drug user. Um, myself. Um, and so I fell into this position, honestly. Um, I had moved to San Francisco 11 years ago. And, um, you know, it was the first place I'd ever lived um, in my short little life uh, where I felt like I fit. Um, it was in everything about the city. It was in the fact that I could walk around and nobody was a stranger. Like, everybody was different from me and everybody had stories and I just wanted to hear everything and I wanted to know everything and everybody um, and eventually <laughs> really made my way to syringe access programs, uh, otherwise formally really referred to as needle exchanges. Um, I found a little baby needle exchange that had been in existence um, for about a decade at that point and it was scrappy and it was um, you know, mostly funded by the volunteers who ran it. Um, and I eventually um, found them and um, feel very lucky that I did. And so every Saturday for like six years, I worked and then eventually ran the Sixth Street uh, Needle Exchanges Late Night Exchange um, in Sixth Street in the, it's called the South of Market neighborhood now, but um, it's really the Sixth Street Corridor is what it's known as. Um, and I, yeah, this is the best. Next to Chico. 
<laughs> next to Chico's Pizza. Thank you, Alex. Um, yes, next to Chico's, um, right between the Rose Hotel, and it used to be um, a porn shop with, um, <laughs> it used to be like a porn shop with those old school booths, um, and we were constantly having to um, reverse overdoses in those booths, um, and, you know, really being part of uh, a community-based response to what I would consider, what I, what I refer to as not just um, poverty, but the, like, real-time effects of the war on drugs, the real-time impact of the war on drugs, and um, it was really out there that I started to realize, not started to realize, but really was able to name why my experiences as, um, you know, the, the, the child of people that had been um, harmed by carceral systems and harmed by, you know, the treatment industrial complex and all that, like why my experience as a white person was so different from what I was bearing witness to around me. And so um, I came up on Sixth Street and um, through the years, just really fell in love with what I would consider um, harm reduction as I know it. Um, and, you know, for folks who maybe aren't as familiar harm reduction, and especially these days, we try to stay focused here, but, you know, um, harm reduction as it really began and as it really um, got a foothold, it really began at, uh, during um, the start of the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Um, you know, people who use drugs, specifically people who injected drugs, um, were at very high risk for, uh, or for HIV and were also extremely marginalized, extremely like the words disenfranchise, all of those things. Um, but really they were all the same people and they were being system, like systematically, not even ignored, but like systematically like excluded and harmed um, by either whatever response San Francisco had and the lack of response from federal and state governments. Um, and so people who use drugs, um, cause especially during that time, it was HIV and AIDS was really seen as um, uh, something that was impacting specifically like the gay male community. Um, and if you were not in that demographic and if you were not white, you were being um, swept off the side and resources were not accessible to you. And so harm reduction really started in San Francisco in the early 90s as an act of civil disobedience, uh, distributing syringes um, and anything that had to do with using drugs um, was illegal at the time um, and still was illegal up until Yeah, I would say still pretty illegal um, with some like local caveats to like allow us to, to skirt that law up until the early 2000s. Um, and so part of my work, you know, and that was that work was started by people who use drugs, by people who are absolutely impacted by um, overdose, HIV, homelessness, um, all of those things that intersect on top of what is broadly called the overdose crisis these days. I don't like to use that language, um, even though my entire job is about that very specific crisis. Um, but I think as harm reduction grew in popularity, as like the framework, because the framework is really what I hold on to, and harm reduction really is, um, it centers the needs of the people that are the, the needs and expertise and brilliance and strategies um, of the people that have been the most harmed by the war on drugs that are specifically targeted by the war on drugs. Um, and so I stopped using language like people who are harmed by uh, the effects of drug use, because it's not just the drug use that is the issue. Um, in fact, everybody uses drugs on some level. What actually matters in our society is who you are, and what drugs you're using, right, is when we start to get a little nitpicky around who deserves what in terms of compassion and resources. So the war on drugs isn't about ending drug use, and it's certainly not about ending overdose. In fact, it's just about pushing people um, that have been made, uh, that have been kept down, right? And so for me, when I talk about harm reduction, harm reduction doesn't exist to like solve the world's problems. It literally exists to prevent more harm 
to be a barrier between the people who are always the most harmed by these systems um, to try to reduce their harm when it comes to certain things, right? So providing uh, sterile injection equipment, um, so new injection equipment um, uh, for people so that they don't have to share syringes and risk uh, uh, transmitting HIV or Hep C throughout their community, right? But it goes deeper than that. Like anybody can, like you can get syringes at Walgreens, um, but the actual point of the work we do is to remove the barriers, remove the stigma, and use these kind of, and, and really ask folks, ask the community, like what, what is the most helpful for you right now? Um, so for instance, in the early days, we were teaching people how to bleach their syringes because that's the resources they have. We didn't have, people didn't have money. They barely had money for food, right? Barely had, they were unhoused, they're sleeping outside. So they don't have money for new syringes and syringes access at that point was illegal not happening so what do you do you do the best you can with what you got and in that case that was bleach and you bleach your syringes we had entire systems I remember doing it in North Carolina and helping my parents do it um, and it was just a way that you knew to keep yourself safe and so for us who came up in those communities that's just stuff you did um, it made sense that's what you did for each other it was only when um, and so for me, when I grew up, I was like, yeah, it's just what you do. And it was only when other people found out what you were doing that you realized not everybody was just doing this thing, right? Um, it's kind of like when you grow up as a kid, you don't know other people grow up any different than you until you realize it, you know? Um, and so that was a lot of, that's how harm reduction started. So it centers the people that are the most harmed. It names the fact that the war on drugs um, isn't just like some accident, right? It is, uh, the war on drugs is like a specific set of tactics. It's like the modern war on drugs as we know it today, which really started in the eighties. Um, and it literally just exists to punish uh, black people specifically, um, but any communities of color, um, anybody living in poverty, um, it really seeks to not only continually traumatize and punish them, but to keep those communities down, right? To keep them in systems of incarceration, which just is a continuation of slavery, right? And so like the war on drugs is an arm of, 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 of like lost my words. Um, but yeah, it is like there, it is not an accident. I guess is what I really try to say is like, Alex, thank you. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what I want to say. The war on drugs is really a war on people and it fills prisons, lines pockets of rich people. Um, and it really just perpetuates a lot of generational trauma. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that comment. Um, I'm going to be back on track. Um, and so, you know, I think in terms of the work we do, right, naming the reality here, San Francisco is a, I feel very comfortable saying that. Um, San Francisco is like a neoliberal nightmare um, and people want, they want to say that we're doing, we're extremely, there's so much money going into services that are here to support people who, who are living in poverty, people who are systematically harmed, people experiencing the largest sets of health disparities, all of these things, but none of this money goes towards any sort of root cause for any of this, right? So um, my work um, specifically um, has turned into, it used to just be like, we wanna make sure we put, like the purpose of the DOPE project is to ensure that pe the people who are at the highest risk for overdosing themselves or witnessing an overdose, which is just people who use drugs, um, that they have constant low barrier access to Narcan or Naloxone, and this is, the nasal version of it, you may have seen it around. Um, it's just a medication that when administered during an opioid overdose, um, reverses the effects of the overdose and the person starts breathing again. Um, and so it is a medication that's completely safe. It has no other purpose except for to reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. And so what we, and this was people who use drugs that came up with it in the, early, the late nineties, they were like, yo, if people are overdosing on heroin, we should just give them Narcan so that they don't ever have to call 
number one, because people who use drugs, if like, and you know this, if you came up in any of these communities, like a 911 call doesn't mean you're necessarily getting saved. It doesn't mean you're actually getting what you need. A 911 call means that you're alerting a system that was designed to harm you, um, that you are experiencing a medical emergency. Um, um, that medical emergency, because it's drug involved, is stigmatized. And so now you have, if you have first responders that show up, um, not only like at the minimum, they're gonna harass you, treat you like garbage, insult you, tell you to stop using drugs, um, tell you that it's your fault that you experienced the medical emergency, um, threaten you, arrest you, you lose your kids, you lose your house, you lose your job, everything, right? So you risk, as a person who uses drugs, as a person experiencing that kind of severe medical emergency, you risk your entire life um, by calling 911. And so people who use drugs are like, take them out of the equation, just give them Narcan and that uh, will prevent death, right? We'll give them Narcan, we teach them how to use it, and that's the thing. So that is what our program is built off. That's what we started doing um, in 2003. Um, and very quickly, we proved that it worked. So we started out as, uh, and I say we, I consider myself part of the, like, the legacy of this program, but I wasn't around during that time. But um, it started off as a program of five volunteers that literally sat in the places in the programs where people who use drugs were accessing services and it's mostly strange access programs because those were the programs specifically for them. It was one of the, some of the only programs at the time people could come in as known drug users and be held in, for all that they are and not judged, right? And so and we just went there and gave it. This is how, what an overdose looks like. This is how, and this is how you use Narcan, right? right? And pretty quickly, what happened early on was that um, people survived their overdoses. So for the first time in history, like for the first time in history, like there were other options to surviving your overdose other than like hoping that someone saw you and threw you in a cold shower, shoved ice down your pants, uh, um, injected you with some sort of stimulant as a way to reverse the overdose. Those are all tactics that people use in the absence of having the actual resource to safely um, deal with the issue, right? And so Narcan has no other purpose but to do that. It's cheap, you know, and so we said, we could afford it. We can get our hands on it. All we need is a doctor to sign a standing order prescription. We got one, we started buying it and we started putting it right into the hands of people who use drugs. And 20, because we started in 2001, technically, we started doing Narcan in 2003 and about 20, years later, we are. Um, <laughs> I just laugh because it's huge and I can't believe I'm a part of something like this, but um, we went from five volunteers distributing about maybe five to six kits into our community a week um, to 25 distribution sites um, throughout the city, all of which directly serve people who use drugs. Um, over 400 individual trainers that are uh, trained and certified to provide this training to people who use drugs. We give out about 50,000 kits of Narcan a year. Um, and people who use drugs are responsible for reversing, successfully reversing more overdoses than any other group of first responders in San Francisco. That includes EMS and that includes SFPD. Um, Last year, and you know, like the other presenters have mentioned, like last year was really hard. Um, I don't like to talk about it much, to be honest with you. Um, we lost a lot of people. We lost them very quickly. There's a lot of reasons for that, um, but the root causes have not changed. Um, and so, but last year alone, people who used drugs were responsible. And you might have heard the news, right? Like 700 something people passed away. Um, from opioid overdose specifically in San Francisco, which is a huge number, it's devastating. Um, but what you also don't always hear about is that over 4,600 overdoses were reversed just by our community, right? And so that's like 4,600 times people who use drugs, people experiencing homelessness, their loved ones 
had Narcan, witnessed an overdose, used that Narcan to reverse the overdose, and that person survived. This year, we've already passed 5,000 successful reversals. Um, and so, like, I always tell, you know, I push back against our politicians, our city leaders to say, like, you know, like, you have this idea of people who use drugs and people experiencing homelessness that they are somehow not capable of taking care of themselves or others, that actually people who use drugs because they use drugs are um, incapable of taking care of themselves, that they're actually like a harm to their communities. Like that's the, that's the messaging we often get, but really people who use drugs, um, like look at what they're capable of for their communities um, when they just have access to the resources they need to take care of themselves and each other. And so when I talk about like abolition work and how we do it, um, you know, I, we work with everyone. I work, yeah, I, but for me, abolition work in this realm is about being the barrier. I am like, this program stands between the systems that are designed to harm and exclude our people and says, we'll actually divert resources to them and help them build power and, and, and um, resources and education and amplify their lessons out um, and protect them from these systems. And so it's like a roundabout way. I just got a message that I got to wrap up, but um, that's kind of what I do. Um, and yeah, um, yeah. Sorry, I'm a little scattered tonight, but yeah, it's, it's the magnitude. Um, is, it's hard for me to fathom. Um, it feels devastating for me to fathom that our people have been put, that we have been put in such dire situations that this is what's necessary. Um, and I um, feel very proud part of such a resource, or such a resourceful and resilient community as well. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much, Kristen, um, for your time and for all the presenters for sharing the beautiful work y'all have done and are doing. Um, I'm so grateful for y'all tonight. And tonight, uh, or right now, we're going to uh, start our Q&A. So we will now begin with our 10-minute Q&A for Black, Indigenous, people of color, class members, uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color, please raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question or type something in the chat to let us know that you'd like to speak or that you'd like to have your question read aloud for you. Uh, we will open it up for questions for everyone else in the last five minutes. Um, and after the Q&A, we will go into breakout room discussions. Please remember to send a message to the person marked as host to let them know if you are white so that we can arrange the breakout rooms accordingly. Aritra had to head out, but Aditi is here um, from Defund SFPD to answer questions related to public safety and the mission. And uh, we just want to start off, you know, with asking all the all our presenters um, the question of, in your wildest dreams, how do you imagine us creating an abolitionist world? And how um, does this overlap with Seth? Who would ever like to go first? I will, I'll start because this is something I was literally just like talking about and, and looking at on, um, on a page that I follow. And I think to abolish police and prisons, uh, we first must abolish the culture of punishment in our daily life and relationships. Um, and I think that as a society, we're conditioned to believe that punishment is the correct form to deal with conflict and to deal with harm. And um, until we can step away from that way of dealing with things, um, it's going to be really hard to achieve an, an abolish uh, or a poli uh, police free society, um, a prison free society. Um, without having like that self-reflection and being able to deal with the own, our own like situations in our life um, without punishment. Uh, yeah, stop there.
I was gonna go meet Chris, but um, I'll I'll go just because I think what I was gonna say is like kind of related to what Willis was saying, and and for me, right, to even achieve at you know this goal of abolition, I, one it's it's a really big and hefty goal, right? Like I mentioned that you know are we gonna get there in our life sometimes? Like I'm not I'm not so sure, but I think we have to practice like these sort of sort of like we have to engage in these practices like in our daily lives as if it was gonna happen tomorrow. And so for me, like abolition and what that like looks like in my wildest dreams is just really nurturing and building relationships with each other and really kind of understanding as other people as people as humans right like and with all the desires and needs and wants and flaws um that we are all kind of capable of and and then also kind of like looking at alternative ways of like dealing with conflict like like Lewis was saying right and just seeing sort of like and centering humanity um right because I think we can certainly agree right that there are all these various like oppressive and violent and carceral structures that govern our, our lives and particularly the lives of um of of communities of color and particularly black people and indigenous people um but and, and those certainly need to be torn down but I think it's like what are we building and how can we build that together and I think through the process of like creating and sustaining and nurturing these relationships we really get to understand the ways in like all these various systems really intersect and I think that helps us really refine the analysis really refine our strategy and like taking down all of these things that we need to take down while also kind of building you know this this real like sense of community as we do that work. I think I view it as like a, um, just like in, like for me, like individual, like the human kindness and like the kindness in all of us and in our hearts, like, so I like, that's my road to an abolitionist world is like being kind no matter what. And that's not always easy, <laughs> um, but ending those kind of um, like the generational harms, right? So like when I trace my generation of harm like back to people on myself, like I, I want it to be different for the people after me. Um, and so I view really, uh, you know, it's like a, I know that I won't see the end of it. I won't, I won't see the end of all of this in my lifetime and it is a privilege but to have just a minute to have said like we moved it forward um and then um people come and top our shoulders you know i am atop the shoulders of so many people before me and it is uh yeah so like for me it's like really and just pulling everyone i can with me um and climbing with everyone and just being a piece of that has been for me like the yeah, so the kindness that we extend to each other and the ways we hold each other um, feel like the way. Definitely. Aditi, did you want to share? Um, sure, and, and thanks all for, for having this space. Um, uh, I am an organizer with Defund uh, SFPD now, just because Aritra uh, could make the second half. I'm just filling in um, for them. Um, and just as a as a really quick visual description, um, I am a South Asian femme with um, kind of messy uh, black hair um, on my couch with a white uh, uh, door in the background. Um, and the, the only thing, I think everyone uh, had such beautiful answers. Um, the only thing that I think I wanted to add, and I think it speaks a lot to what you were just saying, Kristen, in terms of, um, you know, when when we're talking about our, uh, like, meet your neighbors sort of work, it's really to cultivate relationships and connections with individuals um, that, that will show up for you when you need them. Um, as opposed to sort of like um, depending on on systems and structures of of harm and punishment that we do right now, um, and there's this this um, 
beautiful book by Adrienne Marie Brown called Emergent Strategies, in which she talks about sort of this idea of fractal and sort of like cultivating what you want to see at the larger scale at this with, by cultivating it at the smallest scale. And so the question that we have is like, okay, what does it look like to be in abolitionist relationships with your neighbors, with your family, like with your loved ones? Um, and how do you sort of think about that then sort of growing over time? And I think it starts with those sort of like one-on-one -on -one connections first. Um, so we can sort of practice what that looks like at scale. Yeah, definitely. I I love all the answers. And um, there was a second part to that question about uh, how does this overlap with CCSF? But I feel like y'all basically answered it, you know, <laughs> like every what with, with, with y'all said. Um, and I just want to open it up to the rest of, um, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color. If you feel more comfortable sharing your question in the chat, um, feel free to do that as well. And we'll hold space for it. Um, y'all's questions right now. I'll give like a minute. Uh, okay, Charlie has a question. Would you like to say it out loud, Charlie? Yeah, I'll go for it. Um, hi, Charlie, he, him. Visual description, I am a light-skinned, white-passing Caribbean Latino with uh, glasses, floral shirt, dark curly hair, um, some facial uh, stubble, and a bookshelf and a blue wall behind me. Um, my question, I originally thought of this question with Kristen in mind, but I think it does apply to um, everybody. Um, the Kristen specific bit first. So um, context, I actually met Kristen a few weeks back at a Narcan training. It was very serendipitous. I had no idea we were gonna run into each other. But since then, people have been asking me like where to get Narcan trained and I didn't, I found the training that I went to off of Twitter. I didn't know where to direct people. So the, the part of the question um, that stems from that is like, if someone wants to get involved in what you're doing, whether it's, you know, in Kristen's case, getting Narcan trained or, you know, in the case of the other organizers, um, you know, like just getting involved in the work that you do, like what's the best way to plug in? You know, what's the best way to spread the word? What's the, you know, the best way to get our feet wet in, you know, in the work that you're doing? Um, hi, Charlie. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to drop some like uh, just places in the chat um, for folks to go and actually get the Narcan. Um, there's a one, if you want to get involved, I would highly recommend um, finding a syringe access or harm reduction program that you can volunteer for. Um, that is how I got involved 11 years ago. It's how most people I know um, doing this work got involved was just, and that's how you learn, right? Is really getting in there. I know that, um, and I'll put this in the chat, but a few organizations do like kit packing parties um, um, and um, like that sort of thing. And it really helps you just like sit and be with people and really get to know the work and like the resources and how people come to the work. Um, in San Francisco, if you want Narcan, it is free. Um, don't ever spend a cent. And Charlie's already heard me like lecture people. I was like, you personally insult me if you pay for Narcan in San Francisco. Um, um, and so like, don't, co-pay is nothing. It's free. So um, if you would benefit from engaging with a frontline harm reduction program, um, we encourage you to do so, and please feel free to DM me if you want to do that a little more privately, and I can refer you to somewhere that would fit your needs. Um, those programs are funded to serve people with little to no resources, 
Um, and so we try to keep um, that kind of that, that work centered on those folks um, and they're excellent resources. And so if you know you would benefit, please let me know, I'm happy to connect you. We also have um, two places you can go to just get Narcan um, and get a brief training. Um, and I'll drop those in the chat and people can decide what works best for them. <laughs> Awesome. Um, Sean had a question, but did anyone else want to answer any of the presenters on how to connect with y'all? I think that was for everyone. Okay. Sean. Yeah, so Kristen, for the Narcan, like I had like a question. Which one do you like the I like which ones are more like are easier, not easier, just more dependable. Would you agree that IMs are more dependable than the nasal ones? Um, so Only for the simple fact that like, like, so say somebody like hey, is, is ODing and they fall face down, mm -hmm. right? And their whole nose is like really fucked off. Like, you know, like, in, like I've found out that it's easier to use like the intramusculars than the nasal ones. And I'm only saying that because it's more, it, it, I think it's more important to learn how to use intramuscular ones than nasal ones. Cause with the nasal, all you do is just open it and then just shoot it. And yeah, you have the Narcan right there. All you mm -hmm. do, right. <laughs> all you do with an, exactly. And the nasal right there with the nasal, all you do is just open it. Right. But with like, with the, the intramuscular, it's really hard to sit there and like, like learn how to use it. My point is when you, would you recommend learning? Like, obviously you would recommend learning the IM, but which one is more important in your opinion? I would, so just for some context, in case folks um, aren't familiar, there's two types, there's several types of like Narcan products out there. So again, we were dealing with pharmaceutical products. Um, so there's multiple versions, right? So the cheapest, which is what we supply the most of um, because we can actually like afford it is this little baby right here. This is one dose of injectable naloxone or Narcan. Narcan, just again, language. Narcan is like a product, like a brand name, but it's the most familiar name for this. Nobody runs around the streets calling it naloxone. They call it Narcan, like it's a verb. Like I got Narcan last night, you know, so. Um, so this is what people use mostly in our community and they inject it with a muscling syringe. It goes right into the muscle. Um, and the nasal, this nasal version is more expensive, but it's a little easier for folks to use if they're not as familiar with injectable, just pops right up that nose, one click. Both, so, and here's the caveat. They both work the exact same. They are equitable doses. It is mostly comes down to people's comfort level with using a syringe during a medical emergency in crisis and shoving something up someone's nose during a medical emergency in crisis. So um, we do a lot of work to kind of demystify a lot of this. Um, but both work just as well. Both are just as effective for any opioid overdose. Um, we often teach people if people go face down, right, we're pulling them back up, we're rolling them onto their side and we're administering in the nasal if that's what you have. So a lot of the work I do because I came up, you know, in these environments, like I've dealt with a lot of these scenarios. And so really walking people through how to do this because it, it, it is scary, it is, it is, I like don't try to like sugarcoat it. It is very scary even though the process of marketing from someone is like very uh, simple. It's still scary, but both doses work the exact same. I wouldn't recommend one over the other. It's just about your comfort level. And I'm happy, I'm glad we can offer options for people. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I was unmuted this whole time. I apologize for that. I'm so sorry. Um, and then not everyone got a chance to like answer the other question, um, but thank you for sharing it in the chat. <laughs> thank you, Kristen. Um, and Kari um, said I, her question 
And the question is for all of y'all. For I'm wondering about how you've built your organizing strategies to center, include directly impacted folks in your city. And if you have any specific tactics. And this question is for all the presenters. Um, so I'll start. Um, so for vessels, um, engaging a community is is pretty challenging. Um, just to give a little bit of context, Vallejo ha is has a population of about one hundred and twenty thousand people, um, as opposed to San Francisco, which I believe has about eight hundred thousand people. So we're a smaller city compared to SF, but um, but it's also a bedroom city. So people come to Vallejo to go home and go to sleep, and then they're crossing the bridge to go to work. They're going to San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, um, over this way in Napa, Sonoma, things like that. And so people aren't in this working in the city that they live in. People aren't actively engaged in the city that they live in. They're usually doing a lot of their things outside of Vallejo. Um, so um, centering and including directly impacted folks, a lot of those folks are people of color, people impacted by police violence, um, our unhoused communities here. Um, it starts with building trust. Um, we, we want people to trust us and we wanna build relationships and so we just want to get to know people, and that's kind of what we're actively doing. Um, when we first started organizing, um, we we weren't trusted as an organization, and I think that that's common here in Vallejo. There's a lot of like mistrust in people coming around, asking for money, asking for donations, and um, promising that they're going to do something or change something when they really just have personal and self interest. Um, so we kind of had to just like play it like slow and just trust the process of like showing people that we're here to stay. We care about the community and we're, we're not going anywhere. Um, and we've been able to build a lot of relationships um, with the family members who've lost loved ones to police violence. We've been able to build good relationships with um, people from the unhoused community who we um, do weekly distributions to through our mutual aid work um, and I think like tactics of what's the question tactics of like centering those folks um, just starts with, with what I said before is just like building that trust and and relationship building um, and I don't know if anyone else wanted to share Um, I added the question again in the chat if anyone else would like to answer. This has been a journey, I think, if I want to answer the how you how we build organizing strategies to center um, our folks. Um, I think one, you have to know who your people are, right? And so you have to really know who is the most impacted by the thing. Um, and oftentimes in San Francisco that those decisions aren't based in data or evidence. 
Um, so I feel very lucky and very privileged to have the relationships I do that I've formed over a long period of time that I'm able to access data and be trusted with a lot of data to really look and plus being keyed into the communities that are most impacted and really um, asking, like, what do you need? What is it that is not happening for you? Um, because when you get yanked into these like bigger public health systems, these bigger political systems, like we're starting to advocate around policy changes, like, none of those systems center our people. And it is really hard um, to, to, it was a really hard lesson to learn that those systems will never right, as they're built. And like, that really is like my journey to abolition where I'm like, you will never make room for us. You will never make decisions based on what we need. You're gonna make decisions based on what the most people need and that's not us. Um, or what the easiest decisions are, you know, it's a lot of that temporary solutions to, to really um, profound root issues. And so um, for me, it was like, I'm gonna give those realms very little energy um, and that my job is to really like because I did I got wrapped up in it for a really long time and it was like making me ill um, because of it and so I was like I'm actually going to give very little energy because um, at the end of the day none of those people are harmed by the war on drugs in the way that the people that we serve are and so why am I giving them that much energy Yeah, I think it's also just like show, like continuously showing up um, in in these spaces and like going out physically with yourself and, and other organizers if you can um, and or also doing things. I think um, the Vessels of Vallejo folks talked about this a lot, but like thinking about mutual aid and what are ways that you can show up for folks really explicitly. Um, those are those are some things that that we've done um, that I think has has um, slowly sort of like I think Kari what you said like slowly tried to move at the speed of trust for sure. Um, I just wanted to add one more thing. I think it's also important as like organizers or as an organization to have. Um, directly impacted folks, a part of your organization, um, out there doing the work and being able to identify and relate with other impacted folks. So if you can't relate to the experience of the people that you're trying to help or work with, um, you won't really be able to get too far. Um, so having, having at least one person or a few people part of your organization um, who are connected in that way would be key. Thank you so much for answering the questions, everyone. So we will now go into our booths until 8.10. If at any point you're comfortable in the breakout room, feel free to come back to the main session. Um, presenters, you're welcome to stay and join the uh, join breakout rooms. However, fine if you leave. Thank you so much. Thanks, y'all.
Um, so thank you everyone for participating in the breakout rooms. Um, now we're gonna allow time, oh, allow time for any black indigenous people of color to share reflection from their break breakout rooms. <laughs> Let's just someone saying they <laughs> Yeah, we were we were uh, singing together. We were singing Harry, Harry Belafonte together. That's all I'll sing now. <laughs> okay, Fabio, you ready? Come on. This is for the recording. I'm ready. <laughs> tally man, tally me banana. They like come and we want to go home. Come, Mr. Tally man, tally me banana. They like come and me wanna go home. They, they yo, I say they yo. They like come and we wanna go home. They, it's, it's a, a day, day, it's a it's day, day, it's a day. They, they like, like come and we wanna, we wanna go home. home. Live six foot, seven foot, eight, eight foot, foot nine. <laughs> They like, they like come, come and we, and we want, want to go home. home. Okay, good night, everybody. Go home and go to sleep. Get some rest. And when you wake up, get some bananas. find somewhere to go get some Narcan so that you can save a life. Yes. Does anyone want to share any reflections from their group? Okay, I did have a question, and I think that maybe the answer was on the website, but if any of the uh, facility or like the speakers today have any knowledge about if there are programs that provide um resources for drug testing kits to be distributed for free. I'm really interested about that because I think that that's also a really uh, important resource to have like fentanyl testing strips and stuff um, for folks who are going to use. And if not here, like, please go on Discord and like drop knowledge if you have any, but uh, yeah, I'll continue to explore that question for us as well, so we know. Yes, uh, beyond the dub project and like other places, like if they're are resources for folks who have organizations that would like to provide testing strips or things like that. Um, I'm, I'm curious to find out more. That's a good question. Yeah, thank you, Alex. I think um, getting in touch with Kristen would be cool. To ask that and if no one else has any reflections I know everyone probably is very tired it's been a long day um but thank you all for this space it was my first time facilitating <laughs> I was you so nervous great, Jess. You thank, and you. Did amazing. Thank, thank you so much. thank you I had a pleasure thank you all the speakers I hope everyone has a great night and see you next class.